Hello everyone and welcome to another Genshin Theory video. Today, I'll be going over my thoughts on the Kari Bear Archon Quest, as well as a theory on Abyssal Power and what it is. I decided to do the Fontaine speculations every other week from now on until I reached the Mega video, so I thought it would be about time I talk about Kari Bear. Also, if you like this video, consider subscribing. It helps me out a lot and I'd really appreciate it. With all that said though, let's get right into the video. Before I begin, this video will have spoilers for the Kari Bear Archon quest, so if you haven't played through it yet, I recommend doing that first before coming back here. This quest gave us a good amount of information on the Abyss Order and the Abyss itself, which is mainly what I want to talk about today. In this quest, we relive the memories of the Traveler's sibling, back to a time when they traveled with Dainsliff. In these memories, we meet a man who calls himself Ida, who is later revealed to be Clotar Alberic, the founder of the Abyss Order. He is working to heal his son, Kari Bear, who was transformed into a hilly troll during the Cataclysm. Back when Clotar was young, he snuck away to the Royal Library of Conria, where he read a banned book that told of a medicine that was imbued with the power of the God of Wisdom. This medicine could supposedly awaken the mind from a state of deep stupor, so he decided to use it to help Kari Bear recover his clarity of mind. Now, the ingredients to make this medicine are quite interesting. As Ashkai pointed out in her Kari Bear analysis videos, the three main ingredients are imposters. Sumer roses are not actually roses, Kapalata lotuses are not actually lotuses, and the strange mushrooms may look like the Rukashava mushrooms found around Sumeru, but are quite likely something very different. The mushrooms are grown with the help of water, taken at around 2 in the afternoon from a waterfall near the Statue of the Seven east of Gandarvaville. While the traveler is waiting at the field for Clotar to return with the fertilizer, monsters attack. The traveler believes that the monsters were attracted to the field for some reason as well. Perhaps the field has a similar effect to leyline disorders, which monsters are also attracted to. This could hint towards some abyssal powers having an effect on the field, maybe due to the fact that Kari Bear's mother is buried in it. Anyways, after all three ingredients are combined to make the medicine, there is one more step that must be done. Of course, this final step is to receive a blessing from the Dendro Archon at a Statue of the Seven, much to Clotar's dismay. Unfortunately, the medicine doesn't work at first, even with Clotar bowing to the Statue of the Seven. The Traveler convinces them to try again, and so he does. With a second dose of the medicine made, the two return to the Statue of the Seven. Before they can do anything though, Clotar spots a hilly troll who he believes is Kari Bear headed towards the chasm. After following it a bit, they realize it's not Kari Bear, but are still curious as to where they are going. It leads them to the unknown sanctuary in the chasm, a mysterious place that Clotar says he hadn't noticed before. They notice some hilly trolls are alternating between walking and kneeling in worship, although they are unaware of who or what they could be worshipping at this moment. Eventually though, they come across a Frostfall Herald, and after the Traveler defeats it, they find what the hilly trolls were worshipping. It was a giant purple crystal floating in the air, held by six strands of chains. The crystal speaks into the Traveler's head, addressing itself as a sinner, which is what I'll be calling it from now on. The sinner tells the Traveler, or rather their sibling, that he knows their fate well, and tells them to rise beyond it. Dainsliff later hints to us that the sinner may have seen us in a way, being able to communicate to us even through a memory. Anyways, the sinner also sends wisps of purple energy into Clotar's body, who remarks that he somehow feels even better than when they first entered the domain. After this, they leave the domain and give the second dose of the medicine to Kari Bear, which successfully restores his clarity of mind. Because of this, Clotar calls the sinner a truly mighty god, and begins worshipping it as well. He would then go on to form the Abyss Order with the help of the sibling. Now, the sinner is shown to have miraculous powers. He could speak into someone's head, see through memories, and partially or maybe even entirely heal celestial curses. 
His power likely also influenced the creation of the Abyss Heralds, Lectors, Mages, and other members of the Abyss Order. His powers also seem to mirror those of Celestia in a way. Celestia transformed the people of Conria into Hillichurls, and or forced immortality onto them, while the Sinner has been shown to be able to partially reverse this. The Hillichurls are considered monsters with little intelligence, while the Abyss Heralds and the others are intelligent beings with great strength. Before I go more into this, I'm sure you'd like to hear my thoughts on who I believe the Sinner really is. I linked videos by IslandXD, Ashkai, and Chill with Aster in the description, where they go a bit more in depth on other ideas about the Sinner, and I highly recommend you check them out. Now, I believe it is possible that the Sinner may not be anyone we have heard of in lore, not even King Deshret or King Ermin. Instead, I believe that the Sinner could be an Abyssal God. If this is the case, he would have existed for all time, which would line up with him saying he would shed a tear at the end of time as he looks back at the Traveler's or their sibling's life. He also talks about knowing about fate, and that the sibling should rise beyond their fate. Now, the sibling is accounted for in Ermansul, so perhaps the sinner has some sort of access to the knowledge within Ermansul. Him telling the sibling to rise beyond their fate also hints that he is from beyond Tavat, and knows the truth of the world. Honestly though, I am leaning towards the King Deshret theory myself, but I think it's still fun to throw other ideas out there. In my opinion, I think the Sinner may be some sort of embodiment of the universe, and that the Abyss and the universe are one and the same, but that's for the next section. For now, I'd like to talk about the properties of the Abyss, including how some perceive it as warm and welcoming, while it is poisonous to others. The term Abyss can be used to describe many things in Genshin. It is the Void Realm beneath the Light and Human Realms, as well as the mysterious region that is located both beyond and beneath Tavad. It could also be sentient in a way, with the Abyss Order being driven on by the Abyss. Speaking of the Abyss Order, they are not the Abyss, but rather a group who praises it. They receive blessings from the Abyss, such as the forms of Abyss Heralds and Lectors, as well as abyssal powers that mimic the elements. Interestingly, none of these abyssal creatures have powers similar to that of Dendro, which is another point I'll touch on in the next section. Anyways, the abyss is harmful to most other things in Tavat, with it being described as the only thing that could dye Morax's stone pillars black. Venti was also briefly poisoned by it during the Mondstadt Archon quests, but he was able to rid it from his body by healing at the symbol of Mondstadt's hero, a tree with connections to Celestia. 500 years before these quests, Durin, a venomous dragon, came to Mondstadt and attacked. He was eventually slain by Dvalin and Venti, and fell down onto Dragonspine. However, Durin had no idea that he was causing so much carnage. In his eyes, he was dancing in the sky with Dvalin and Venti, while the people sang below. The truth, however, was much darker. Dvalin and Venti were trying to stop his attack, and the people were screaming in fear. When Dvalin landed the killing blow on Durin, only then did he see what was really happening. Despite the fact that he was dying, he still wished he could have actually sang and danced with everyone, and innocently said farewell to the dragon and the animal archon. His visions of peace may have been a result of the abyssal energy he possessed, with it perhaps bringing a false sense of happiness. Because of this encounter, however, Dvalin was afflicted with abyssal poison, and was later manipulated by the Abyss Order. With the help of Venti, Jean, Diluc, and the Traveler, he was freed from the poison. However, this does further show how abyssal power can affect even the strongest elemental creatures and corrupt their minds. Getting back to Durin, however, his abyssal blood was also able to create crimson agate around Dragonspine and revive the frost-bearing tree. This tree was once a magnificent Ermansul tree, but it was destroyed by a fragment of the Skyfrost Nail. There were a few failed attempts to heal the tree before Durin fell, but in the end, abyssal blood was the answer. As I've said, the powers of the abyss are quite mysterious. It can be harmful to some, yet can be seen as blessings to others. Time also works differently down in the Abyss, 
as when Tartaglia fell down into the abyss as a child, he perceived it as three months. However, when he returned to Devat, only three days had passed. Now, this is where this video gets very, very speculative. As I said earlier, I believe the universe and the abyss are one and the same. So what would that make Tevat? Well, we already know that the skies of Tevat are fake, and that it was created by the Primordial One a long, long time ago. Tevat would then be more like a simulation of sorts, with Erminsul working as the memory for everything that occurs. This would also mean that the abyss is the true sky, but that then begs another question. Why is abyssal power so poisonous to gods and creatures of Tevat? Well, it may be that the people aren't supposed to understand it and come into contact with it. It would be forbidden knowledge to the people of Tevat. Perhaps Tevat was created as a sanctuary from the abyss and was safe from its power, but when the war between the second who came occurred, the abyss was able to creep back in. During this war, we know that the Primordial One sent down the Divine Nails to heal the damage that was caused and to mend the land. This could have been their attempt to stop the Abyss from blighting Tevat, but it wasn't completely successful, as the power of the Abyss still remains. Now, I mentioned earlier that no Abyssal creatures have power over Dendro, and I believe that is because of Erminsul. Erminsul is the root of Dendro power, and it's also what stores the memories of everything in Tevat. Perhaps Erminsul is one of the greatest obstacles to the Abyss's goals in Tevat, and they simply haven't been able to harness its power yet. Alternatively, they may choose not to. Erminsul is very important to Tevat and Celestia, and could be seen as an antithesis to the power of the Abyss. If this is so, then the Abyss would definitely not want to use its power, as it could hurt them more than it helps them. Instead, they may choose to corrupt it, similar to how Forbidden Knowledge was doing that before Ruka Devada was erased from Erminsul. Speaking of Forbidden Knowledge, I'd like to talk about that next briefly, as well as a counter-argument that shows Celestia as the villain. Forbidden Knowledge had many effects on Sumeru, such as the Withering, Elazar, and generally driving people to insanity. Instead of seeing these as bad things, however, if we look at it from an abyssal perspective, this may be the universe trying to fight back and restore balance. Before the Primordial One created Tevat, only the Light Realm and the Void Realm existed. There was a sort of balance between them, with the Light being able to repel the Dark and vice versa. However, when the Primordial One created the human realm we know as Tevat, it threw off this balance. So, the Abyss could be trying to correct this balance, as perhaps the human realm was not supposed to exist. Like I said, this is a wild theory, and is something we won't get answers to for quite a while. At this point, we have no idea who is right and who is wrong between Celestia and the Abyss, so I really hope Fontaine gives us some answers. This video was definitely a bit out there at some points, but hey, it's fun to come up with some crazy ideas sometimes. Things in this video may have been a bit over the place at some points, as I'm still getting used to being on my ADHD medication again. I apologize if it was a bit messy at any time. The Abyss and Celestia are always interesting to talk about though, and I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below as well. Anyways, that's it for this video, thank you so much for watching. Sources and further readings are also in the description if you want to check them out as well. I hope you all have an amazing day, and I'll see you all in the next video.